you gather in, I just want to share with you a couple of things. Next week, I'm going to um, start a three-week series on the purpose of vision, how it works, how vision works, how vision happens, why it's important to have a vision, why God does give us a vision. We'll be talking about vision that builds hope, uh, vision that uh, generates provision. Provision always follows vision, and vision creates life. And so I'm also going to be talking a little bit about our vision as a church and helping us see where we're going. Sometimes we need to do that. We preach Jesus, not the church, but at the same time, we, we need to have an understanding of where we're going and what's happening, the big picture and uh, the little picture. And then also, we'll have some information on the ministry in Cambodia. Obi and Sheila are back. And put together some stuff so we want to share that with you then in March 23rd through Easter we're going to start a series that's inspired by the Son of God movie that's being produced by the same producers that are being being shown in theaters starting I think this week and produced by the same people that produced the Bible series a year ago I understand it's powerful and then drawing from that we're going to talk about Jesus and you his life and your life, his baptism and your baptism, his death and your death, his resurrection, your resurrection, his ministry, your ministry, where, uh, where we connect with him. How many of you know that Christianity is not about a principle, and it's about a person, the person of Jesus? Once you get away from the person, then you get into principles without power. But the power of the gospel is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Today, uh, on the series that we've we've been doing on um, uh, we're going to talk about inheriting the promises the ABC's of financial freedom and then this message today I want to talk about inheriting the promises and I know that sounds pretty uh, kind of religious and that's pretty much it's a boxy uh, phrase as far as uh, religious terminology or biblical terminology but I want to bring it home to where we are today because the promises of God are not something that are way out there. The promises of God are very powerful, and the promises of God are something that are here, they are around us, they are current, and they are not for others, but they are for us. They're not just for others, but they are for us. I, when I was a kid, my mother had this promise box. Do you remember the promise boxes where you, well, you all don't remember that. Did. Steve, do you remember those promises? Thank you. Thank you. Somebody here as old as I am. Yeah, you remember those promise box. You reach in there and pull out a promise. And, and uh, my father came home from Germany when he did. I don't think Dad ever smoked, but he had a cigarette box. Mom didn't know it was a cigarette box, but her little promises fit perfectly in that silver cigarette box. And so I remember one night, uh, one day, somebody, people came to visit with us. My mother, she's kind of a teetotaler, you know, she, 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 you couldn't get the word Winston out of her mouth, you know, it just, she was, and uh, they said, oh, it's a beautiful cigarette box you have there. Well, that silver box disappeared, although I still do have it without the promises, but she, she moved it back into the original promise box, and, uh, but I appreciate that because I learned something about the promises of God, pull out those promises. The Bible is filled with the promises of God, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that because I know you know, we've been talking about finances, and I know that we go through seasons of life where we feel fragile and uh, very vulnerable. And uh, ha have you ever been in a place where you just felt like that one more little thing could just, you know, one more straw uh, could, you know, one more blow could just blow apart the house of cards and, and everything could come down on top of you? Some of you have been there. Some of you will be there. We all experience this type of thing. But I want to encourage you because I've never seen the righteous forsaken, David said, nor their children begging for bread. That God will help you. God will strengthen you. And God will be there on your behalf. Let's go to Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter. It's got some encouraging scriptures to read to you. And I just want to unpack this a little bit, move us forward. Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 35th verse. He says to them, you were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. 
Besides him, there is no other. From heaven, he made you hear his voice to discipline you. On earth, he showed you his great fire, and you heard his words out of the fire. Because he loved your ancestors and chose their descendants after them, he brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great strength to drive out before you nations greater and stronger than you and to bring you into their land to give it to you for your inheritance as it is today. You look at the Old Testament. Here's the picture. The Old Testament people, the people of Israel that came out of Egypt back to the inheritance, back to Abraham's inheritance. And they, we, we see the counterpart in the New Testament because he takes us out of a world of unbelief, a world of sin, a world that is opposed to God, the things of God, brings us into a place of provision, into his kingdom. Now I want to go to Deuteronomy, the 7th chapter, the 17th verse, and the 23rd verse, through the 23rd verse. And he's encouraging them about this thing that we call the inheritance, the inheritance, that which he has for him. You may say to yourselves, these nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? But do not be afraid of them. Remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. And remember those things God's already done. You saw with your own eyes the great trials, the signs and the wonders, the mighty hand, the outstretched arm with which the Lord your God brought you out. And the Lord your God will do the same. Just underline that. He will do the same to all the peoples you now fear. Moreover, the Lord you will send the hornet among them until even the survivors who hide from you have perished. Do not be terrified by them, for the Lord your God is among you, is a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will drive out those nations before you little by little. You will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once, or the wild animals will multiply around you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you, throwing them into great confusion until they are destroyed. Now, 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the 11th verse, brings this into the perspective for the believer. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, as instruction, Instruction, teaching for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So there, we, we need to see this today, that everything there that took place in the Old Testament with God's people was a prototype of what was going to take place here. It was a precursor of the reality. I mean, that was the shadow. This is the real, the Bible tells us. Spiritual, the kingdom of God. Jesus comes along saying, now I'm bringing to you the kingdom, you've heard of it, now this is the kingdom. He taught the kingdom, he preached the kingdom, the disciples followed him, preaching and teaching the kingdom, which is the rulership of God in our lives, which is possessing our inheritance, and what God has for us. I think it's important for each of us to remember this, that not one of us is an accident. You're not here by accident. Even if it was a human accident, it was not God's accident. You're here on purpose. Because if you're here on purpose, then God distinctly and powerfully has something in store for you. He has what we would call the inheritance. And not only do I need to see the inheritance, I need to possess that inheritance. Let's just go on to the scripture here. Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, the 23rd verse. Now he says to them, Then he brought us out from there, speaking of Egypt, that he might bring us in, to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. So God brought us out to take us in. And may I give you that word of encouragement today. God brought you out to take you in. He's taking you somewhere. And we need to remember this too because some people have said that the promised land was a type of heaven. It really wasn't a type of heaven because there are not going to be giants in heaven. They're not going to be uh, the wild animals in heaven. They're not going to be all stinking stuff they went through once they got into the promised land. 
there's still some turmoil. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when they stepped over the Jordan River, you know, out of the wilderness, into the promised land, the manna stopped right then. So he said to them, said, this is really powerful. He says, uh, I'm going to do great things for you. I'm going to do great things on your behalf. And, uh, but the manna is going to stop. The manna, which came from heaven, he said, that's going to stop. But now I'm giving you houses and land. I've given you responsibility to do with something with what I'm giving to you. Now, so he brought us out to take us in. Look at Colossians, the first chapter, the 12th verse, the 13th verse. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Where does that take place? Right here and now. For he has rescued us, what, out of Egypt, out of the dominion of darkness, brought us in to the kingdom of the Son that he loves. So I want to talk to you uh, and give you five things that I believe take place that help us to inherit the promises of God. Uh, maybe you're saying, I don't know what the promises of God are for my life. That's okay. They didn't know what the promises all entailed either when they went into the land. Maybe I don't fully understand God's vision for me. That's okay. You don't have to understand every little bit of it. But this one thing you can and do need to do, and that is to, to, re, to go for it. So number one, rely on the God of the promise. God says to them, you know, don't be terrified by the nations. Bring to remembrance the faithfulness of God in the past. Did, did, did God help you yesterday? Did God help you last year? Did God help you somewhere along there? Then remember that and, and put your faith in him. Don't, don't trust in the money. Put your trust in God. Sometimes people say, well, if I just, because we're talking about in possessing our inheritance, moving from that dimension where we're struggling with this financial stuff into the place where we're no longer struggling with it. And so he says to them, you know, put your faith in, in me because I've, I've brought you out. <laughs> guy told the story, true story, he had an aunt, her name was Aunt Emma, and she was married to a guy who was kind of a miser, just kind of a tightwad. He made good money, but he, ever, he would keep his money under his mattress because uh, he didn't trust the banks. And uh, he was pretty young when he... Uh, actually got cancer he started to die so as he was dying and it seemed like the latter days uh, he brought his wife and his brothers together he made her promise in front of them that she would take all the money that he had stashed and put it in his coffin so that when when so because he may have to buy his way into heaven I mean, the guy's theology was skewed obviously a little bit this is no joke so they took so she made the promise, much to the amazement of the brothers. They're looking at it like that. She said, yeah, she promised. And so he died, and she took the money and put it in the bank. She wrote a check for $26,000 and put it <laughs> in the casket. <laughs> so <laughs> she's smart, yeah. You know, um, don't put your trust in that. I, there, there, there are times when you say, if I just had this much money, I would be able to make it. Uh, if, if we just had that much if I just had this, if I just had that, if I had this education, if I had that education, had that opportunity, this opportunity, put your trust in the God of the promise. Uh, Proverbs eleven twenty eight says, whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. 1 Timothy 1, uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17, command those who are rich in this present world, those who have a lot, not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in the well, which is so uncertain, and it really is, folks. You know, overnight, people can lose everything. Overnight, people lose everything. But put to put their hope in God. Everyone say hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for your enjoyment. And you might underscore that one because that's a good one. People say, well, this is all about spiritual things. No, he wants you to be blessed with everything for your enjoyment. Number two, be diligent. Be diligent with what God has given to you. And the inheritance has been given. It's ours. But it's for those, really, who will pursue. There are times when we just need to rise up and lay claim on the promises of God. The Bible says the kingdom of God suffers or allows violence. That's really kind of a, 
a bad terminology there, but, uh, but, it, but in the newer translations, the kingdom of God allows for vehement action and those who possess it take it with persistence, take it with force. And so the Bible says, you know, if God has given to you a promise, then be a good steward of that promise and pursue that promise. Here's a couple of good scriptures about laziness. Laziness is not a spirit. Laziness is an attitude. It says, lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. So there's a difference in being lazy and being diligent. And sometimes we can get lazy because we say, well, it's all by grace, therefore I, uh, there's nothing that I need to do. Look at Proverbs 12, 24. Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends up in slave labor. And then I like this one from Hebrews, the sixth chapter, the 12th verse. Talking about diligence. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Two things, faith and patience. You know that even when you're patient, you're being proactive. Patience is not laziness. Patience is not passive. Patience is not acquiescing to the circumstances as they are. Patience means waiting, being willing to wait upon God. What are you doing? Well, I'm effectively, actively waiting upon God. You may believe that God has given to you a promise, and I hope you do believe that. And you may not know for sure exactly what it is, but, you know, every now and then, as you walk with God, I believe that God will drop something in your spirit that will m make it come personally alive for you. And, you know, when that happens, don't give up on it. But have faith and have patience. This time next year, you're not going to be where you are right now. This time, five years from now, you're not going to be where you are. Most of us in this room, we're going to live through whatever we're going through. And there's going to be a better day. Uh, there's just going to be a better day. And sometimes you can get in the midst of the most difficult things. and You just need to take back, sit back, take a breath of fresh air and say, you know what? In spite of it all, there's going to be a better, better, better day. Everybody say a better day. So they inherited the promise. That's the story of all the Bible heroes. <laughs> Number three, throw deep. <laughs> And I'll explain that to you. This journalist was interviewing Ken Stabler. Ken Stabler was one of the great quarterbacks from the 80s. And uh, the journalist said, you know, I want to give you a quote. It comes from Jack London. And he said, I'd rather be ashes than dust. I would rather have my spark burn out in a brilliant blaze than to be stifled by dry rot. I would rather be a superb meteor every atom of me in magnificent glow than a sleepy, perseverant planet, planet. The proper function of man is to live, not to exist. So the journalist said to Stabler, what, what does that mean to you? He says, well, I'm not a theologian. I'm not a philosopher. But I think as a quarterback, what that means to me is to throw deep. That means every now and then you've got to take a risk and you've got to go for it. And you've got you've to you've get back, get into the pocket, and boom, let it fly. And some of the greatest quarterbacks are people who get picked off the most. You know, uh, and, and, and they're great because they hit their target at the right time. And to me, it's an incredible, an incredible gift. I could throw a baseball. I never could throw a football for some reason. My spirals did not go like this. My spirals went like this, just like that. I really confused the enemy a whole lot. But so when, they, when those guys know that if I give it a fraction of a second more, I can release it, and I trust that guy down there. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. Anything can happen, but we do know that when he reaches that place on the field that ball is going to come down and then sometimes it's just absolutely a risk great hudson taylor who is the the first major uh, missionary to india he made this statement without the element of risk 
there really is no need for faith. And you know, sometimes it, you're facing things, I'm facing things, where we're asking God to do great things, and God comes back to us and says, now I want you to do something great. I want you to extend your faith beyond what it has ever been before. Once in a while, you've got to throw deep. You've got to take chances on God. You've got to believe in Him and that His promises, you know, even if it means that you fail. Even if it means that you fail. Somebody asked me one time, Paul, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? And I thought, wow, that is an incredible question. What would I do if I knew that I could not fail? And then when you consider the fact that even if you fail, in the eyes of God, it's not a failure because you were doing it to honor him. So throw deep, folks. Number four, let me give you number four. Everybody live, you okay? Be faithful with what you have. Be faithful with what you have. If you've got an old clunker for a car, clean that clunker up. Don't make it look like it's a chicken shed, you know. Uh, just, uh, you know, just clean the thing up. Get all the junk out of the car. You know, one time I was complaining a little bit about my automobile, and I really felt like the Lord was saying, what are you doing with the one you have now? And I went out and looked at it, and it looked like we'd been living in that car for, uh, well, I'm pretty meticulous, but for me it was bad. And I started cleaning it up. Whatever you have, don't complain about your home. Whatever home God has given to you, make it a nice home. Mow the lawn, or at least get your wife to mow the lawn. I mean, yeah, just take care of whatever God has given to you. How many of you know that if you're faithful over a few things, he will do what? He'll make you ruler over many things. So be faithful with what you have. Several times in the scripture, we're told uh, something similar to what we find in Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Let me read that. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all of your crops. So then your barns will be filled with overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. See, he told them, he said, when you go into the land, you're going to take it, what, little by little so that the wild animals don't surround you and consume you. So he said, I'm going to give it to you piece by piece piece like Harold Woodson was talking about how do you eat an elephant you eat him one bite at a time and sometimes when we look at the financial situation we don't know how we'll ever get through this or get beyond it but you will you will but you do it little by little you don't possess everything that God has for you overnight and sometimes there will be setbacks but then you'll somebody told me said I, I take two steps forward and I take one step back I said well that's good Two minus one still leaves you a step forward. So you're still a step forward. Just keep on moving forward toward God's promise for you. So when we offer our tithe to the Lord, it's based upon specific promises from God. See, that's something that I can begin doing right now. In other words, God is promising that if we honor him with our first fruits, if we trust him with our tithe, he will honor us. He will reward us. The giving of first fruits means that the giver has taken careful thought. See, uh, listen to this scripture, uh, 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, the seventh verse. Each one should give what they have decided in their heart to give. Look at that word decided. That's a good one to underline. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That means that there's some planning here. There's some preparation here. See, a lot of years ago, I settled in my heart that the first 10% of everything that we made, it was going to go to God's work. I just said, uh, that was his. He says that the tithe is holy. It's set apart. It's separate. You take that, you lay that aside. That's a security because you have taken that which belongs to God and you have given it to him. And because of that, you can trust him. Sometimes our trust and our lack of trust is based on the fact that we have not acted uh, upon his word. And I remember being in Bible school, and uh, I was making like, I forget, about $25 a week at the most. That was, 
a good week. Sometimes it was $17. And no, that wasn't 1940. I want you all to know that. It was just, I was just had a very, very poor job. And uh, so I would call home. And, you know, we had at the college there, we had a phone. It wasn't a phone booth. It was just the phone hanging in the breezeway there in the apartments. And so people would be lined up at nighttime to call. And I'm on this conversation with my mom, and my mom is asking me, Paul, are you tithing? And I'm thinking, don't say that so loud. The other guys are sitting right here. And uh, she, she would say, I'd say, Mom, I'm, I'm low on money. She would say, are you tithing? And uh, I would say, I'd lie. I'd say, uh, uh, most of the time, Mom, but I wasn't. But you know what? Because of her teaching and because of what I saw in God's word, I began to realize that part of what I needed to do in order to obtain my inheritance in God, I'm talking about everything, I'm talking about the practical things as well as the spiritual thing, is take the first fruits and give it to him. And began doing that. When Delia and I got married, we did this. We did the same thing. Even when it was, we didn't have it, but we gave it. You know, if you don't have enough to pay the bills, go ahead and take care of God first. And I, I'm just here, and you can, I'll help you with this too. Because if you have a problem with that, I'll help you. If you, if you say to me, I am tithing, I am giving to God the first fruits, and you don't have food to eat, you can come to my house and eat. I will feed you. I'll pay your electric bill uh, as long as you have gas bill only. No, I'll, pay, I'll, I'll help you. I promise you that. And I've never had anybody take me up on that offer before because when you start giving, it opens up the windows of heaven. You say, well, you know, when I make a lot of money, then I'll be faithful. If you're not faithful now, you won't be faithful then. If, you, if you're not faithful with a little, so you won't be faithful with the big. So if you have a hard time giving God a dollar out of $10, when there's a million there, boy, writing that $100,000 check is going to be tough, isn't it? Everybody with me? Let me, let me, let me finish this up here. And I just, I, here's a little disclaimer. I'm not legalistic about all of this. I don't know who gives what. I don't know who tithes. Uh, so that's not something that, uh, that, that, that's something between you and him. But I'm helping you because if you learn this principle, it's going to carry you through. It's just, it is. It's going to carry you through. And um, try it. you like it. All right. Number five, begin praising God for the victory. This is the final thing. My favorite scripture, let me give it to you this year, my favorite scripture Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. Everybody say nothing. nothing. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with praise, with praise, let your requests be made known to God. I like this. So the requests come to him, and first of all, we see prayer and supplication. You know, when I see that word supplication, I think of vehement prayer. I think of, I think of tears. The Bible says that Jesus approached the Father with strong cryings and tears. And we sometimes do exactly the same thing. May I give to you a word of encouragement? When you get into supplication, he hears every word of it. And God sees every tear drop. He's bottling those tears in heaven to pour out a blessing upon you. But when you go through a season... And it may be every week. It may be once a month. It may be sometime during the year. But there's a season in your life where you're going to be, you're going to be in supplication. But in the midst of all of that supplication, that diligent, that fervent, that heartfelt, that which really touches not only the emotion but goes to the depths of your very spirit that wrenches you from without within, Romans the 8th chapter, to a level in fact, where you cannot utter your request to him, you cannot articulate it. But when that is happening, then throw some praise in there too. There are times when you just need to put your hands in the air and you need to walk around and you need to praise God. And praise God for everything that you have. Praise God for everyone that's around you. Praise God for all of the blessings. Praise God, praise God, and praise God. And then praise him some more. And praise him some more. The Bible tells us that the power of praise is this. It just ignites the activity of heaven. And it draws the blessing of God in your direction. I don't know that I fully understand this. 
I just know this, that God loves to be praised. You know, God's favor is on you. God's favor is upon each one of you. But praise releases the reality of that favor of God. It's a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. And let me encourage you this. Sometimes, you know, as we're wrapping up this series, sometimes when you get caught in the middle of something, um, maybe you get to the end of the, uh, end of the paycheck and there's a lot more month left over at the end of the paycheck. Uh, rather than fretting over it, rather than being anxious over this, why not lift this up to the Lord and begin to praise him? And, and just, just worship him in your own way. And, and, and tell the Lord, Lord, I thank you because you're the provider. Lord, I thank you because you're the one who helps me. Lord, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. I praise you, I praise you, I give praise to you. And something about that level of thanksgiving, I believe, moves heaven. And uh, doors open.